So what we've got, you can't read that, can you? What you've got is the PL here of gamma showing revenue of 970, showing cost of sales of 470. And we've got to redraft it on the basis that beta is a discontinued operation. Gamma produces two products, A and B. However, halfway through the year, beta business is sold, is disposed of, and is a discontinued operation. When we sell it, we make a loss of 76. When we sell it, there are costs of 37. At the same time, we reorganize the continuing business at a cost of 98. 76 plus 37 plus 98 makes 211. And that 211 is the loss that we have, and that is represented in the PL. I can see that figure of 211. Now, part of that relates to continuing, and part of that relates to the discontinued operation. I've got the individual results of the alpha product and the beta product separated out, but I then have got a P&L where basically they have been added together. The first thing that I want to do is to calculate the line, the single line. So let us calculate the loss on the discontinued operation. The loss on the discontinued operation. And that loss is twofold. There is the loss after tax. So this is beta. The loss after tax is 40, but that's for the whole year. So the loss after tax that I'm talking about is 20. So we have consolidated in the group accounts six months of beta, six months of her turnover, six months of her distribution, six months of her admin, six months of her tax, six months of her losses. So as her loss overall was 40, I just want to bring in that one figure of 20. But I also have the loss on the disposal. And the loss on the disposal was 76. So when I sold the assets, they were 76 was the loss. There was also the redundancy costs when you got rid of the staff. And the redundancy costs were 37. So the one line that represents the loss from the discontinued operation, which is non-recurring, won't happen again, needs to be separately represented, is 20 plus 76 plus 37 is an overall figure of 133. So my overall loss from a discontinued operation is 133. This is going to be my single line. This is going to be my single line. So I'm now going to present that information in a revised profit and loss account, a redrafted profit and loss account. beta. I am totally and utterly ignoring beta until the death. How much is revenue? 650, yeah. So revenue is 650. 
cost of sales is 320. Distribution is 60. Admin is 120. Exceptional loss, ah, oh, hang on a minute. You only want the exceptional loss that relates to continuing items. So the loss on disposal has been dealt with elsewhere. The redundancy costs have been dealt with elsewhere. But the reorganization of the business at 98, that's part of the ongoing story. This will then give us a profit before tax. I will have my tax as a single line. Uh, sorry, I have my tax only being that of alpha. And this is my profit from continuing operations. So my profit from continuing operations. So, let me fill in some of the gaps. The gross profit presumably is 330. Um, what's the profit before tax? Any of us? 52. And therefore the profit is 12. I haven't finished. Because I now bring in, in my single line, the loss from the discontinuing operations. And the loss from the discontinuing operations was 133. And we should recognize the number at the bottom. The number at the bottom is the loss after tax. The number at the bottom is 121. And that loss after tax is exactly the same number as just above the requirement. But the presentation of the number is presented in such a way that we are trying to encourage the users to extrapolate. I have to include this loss because otherwise I wouldn't be complete. I have to include this loss, otherwise I wouldn't be complete. But if I want to extrapolate, time out for a second. It's actually a very small point of trying to make. And maybe I've successfully made it already. If I'm a chairman, if I'm presenting the financial statements to you, oh my God, it's been a terrible year. Look at that. Look at that. That's a terrible loss. But what I would try to encourage you to do is not look at that. I would ask you to look at that and say, yes, we've had a loss this year, but we've cut the cancer out. We've cut the loss out. Yeah, we've taken the loss away. And this is non-recurring as well. So actually, probably next year, we're going to make profits of 100. Yes, I can see losses. We have made losses. We have made losses. I have to be complete. But I'm presenting the information to you in a way which is relevant, predictive. That's the idea. So is this under this is on the this is uh, this is the presentation of the profit and loss account. This is the face of the profit and loss account. Now, in reality, there would of course be a note, and part of the note would be how much is the loss from trading, how much is the one-off losses, and in fact, you would probably publish the results of the discontinued operation, but how much the turnover was, how much the cost of sales were in the notes of the account. But, you know, your examiner is not really into notes to the accounts. 
So, yes, of course there would be a disclosure um, and an explanation. There always is. Is that okay on IFRS 5? IFRS 5? Yeah, IFRS 5 going. IFRS 5 going. Going. See you again on revision. Yeah, IFRS 5. See you again on revision. Yesterday, the car that I have in the UK was three years old and therefore had to go for an MOT. So that means we've had that car for three years, the previous car we had for 10 years. So the story I'm telling you happened 13 years ago. So 13 years ago, I was sitting at home. And I answered the phone. And when I answered the phone, I heard a woman on the other end of the phone crying. And I quickly realized that it was my wife's cousin, Christine, who was on the phone. Now clearly, she was in an emotional state and didn't really want to talk to me. She wanted to talk to her cousin. So I got my wife, Jenny, on the phone. And what came clear within a few minutes was that her husband had left her. In fact, it was her second husband that had just left her. And left her with two kids from her first marriage, two kids from her second marriage. So she was there left with four children under the age of six and was in an emotional state. So we decided that that weekend, we would drive down to Brighton, where she lived, to visit her, to comfort her, Ever. And I remember the weekend because we had just bought a new car. So we drove down to Brighton and we were thinking, oh, this is nice, it's a nice drive down, it gets the car and, and, and whatever. And of course we realised that we had an old car that we were about to sell. And of course, Christine, you, you want to be a help in that situation. And one way I thought that we might be of help would be to do with our old car because her husband had left and taken the car so she was without a car. So I left it to my wife. I left it to my wife because it was my wife's cousin. Now, I was thinking that our old car was probably worth about £2,000, was probably worth about 10,000 ringgit, something like that. That's what I was thinking we were going to sell our car for. Now, we sold it to Christine for about 500 pounds in the end. So we got about 2,000, 2,500 ringgit, not 10,000 ringgit. And I still to this day don't quite know whether we did the right thing. Should we have given her it and said, there it is, it's free, or should we have charged her the full price? I don't know. Uh, I left it to my wife. I think Christine wanted to pay something so she felt a dignity, that she felt it wasn't just charity she was receiving, and she may have kidded herself that she thought that's what the car was worth. But trust me, the car was worth a lot more than what we sold it for. That is my transaction with a related party. We sold a car for less than it was worth 
to a family member. Jenny and I are not accountable to anybody as to what we do with our money. If we want to give away our assets cheaply to somebody, that's between me and her. But if we were a company, if we were directors of a company, and we were entering into a transaction with a related party, I think our shareholders have a right to know. Yeah, I think our shareholders have a right to know. Whether or not the transaction is at fair value is irrelevant and may be very difficult to judge anyway. When you are transacting with relations, with related parties, it may not be on normal commercial terms, or it may be on commercial terms. You may not have entered into that transaction with them anyway. But it does affect third parties. It does affect the user's understanding. Why has the company done so badly? Why has the company done so well? The company might be doing well because they're buying goods cheaply from a friend. And that might be the reason for the profitability. And if you're buying that company, that cheap source may disappear when you've bought the company because you're not related to the cheap supplier. I do not think I am the only person in this room ever to have bought or sold a vehicle to a family member or borrowed money or lent money to a family member. Related party transactions are perfectly normal. Some of them are a bit dodgy, but related party transactions are normal. And what the standard says is disclose them all. Don't just say, I'll only disclose the dodgy ones, or I'll only disclose those at under or over value. It simply has a blanket disclosure of disclose them all. Make the disclosure. Because that way we are being complete. That way we are being transparent. That way we are laying out the information for the users to interpret and for the users to understand. So this standard is not about measurement. We don't change the numbers. There's no debit, there's no credit, there's no measurement issue. It's all about disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. So related party transactions, what am I going to say? This is a normal part. This is a normal part.